Hello, welcome to As We Want the World to Live. I'm your host, Michael Henderson, and our guests today are a very interesting couple from Northeast India, Stanley and Helen Nichols Roy. Stanley has been very active and still is in the political life of his country. He was for several sessions a member of the Assam legislature. And then when his own state, Meghalaya, uh, re received its autonomy in 1970, he joined the cabinet and had many portfolios there and served again in the Meghalaya Legislative Assembly. Today, he's the general secretary of the main regional political party in his area. Helen comes to the United States from Michigan and was a graduate in English from Vassar College. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you both here. I remember as a schoolboy, I don't know if it's true of American schoolboys, uh, I remembered that uh, Cherrapunji, which was in your constituency as a member of parliament, was the place with the highest member rainfall the in the world. Member of the legislature, not parliament. <laughs> Legis <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. Well, just uh, terms. Yeah. But uh, yeah. we don't know a great deal more about Northeast India, so perhaps you could start off by telling us a little bit about your part of the world. Yeah. Well, I come from one of the small states which was created in 1970 as an autonomous state and subsequently as a a uh, completely separate state in 1972. But uh, it is one of the areas known as the tribal areas of Northeast India. And we have Khasis, who are one of the matrilineal tribes, and Garos, matrilineal tribe. Perhaps of, you could explain what matrilineal means. Well, that's where the uh, line of descent comes from the mother's side instead of from the father's the, the, side. The ruler. ruler in the, no, not the ruler. What does that mean? No. Well, the, the men rule. But the women uh, control the property and the name. The name, the descent, comes through the mother's oh. side. And you're a Kasi. I'm a Kasi. Yes. And oh. my wife is wearing a Kasi uh, Jang Sem, or a dress that uh, one wears on special occasions, sometimes at weddings, sometimes at uh, going to church, or anything of that sort. But Meghalaya is a state which was created as a result of the struggle of the Northeast people, the hill people of Northeast India, and I was involved in that struggle because from 1960 I got involved in politics after my father died. He was a member of the cabinet of Assam and he had been one of those who helped to frame the constitution of India, but I, was never, I never thought that I would get into politics, but after he died, some of my people came and asked me to represent them, and I got involved in politics and became the general secretary of the party, the regional party of that area, and we struggled for many years to separate ourselves from Assam because we are a different type of people. There are many hill tribes in that region, but uh, through this struggle for a separate state within the country, within India, I got involved with many experiences. I was actually a uh, technocrat was in business and in industry, and one of the places where I was trained was here in the United States as a student at the University of California. What, what field? Uh... <clears throat> well, I was trained in food technology, actually, mm -hmm. and then I studied for two years in engineering. Mm -hmm. And is that but, where you met Helen? Yes, I yes. met her at uh, the University of California at a football game, actually. Oh, well, <laughs> what, what impression did Stanley make on you? <laughs> it must have been quite dramatic. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, and we were married in 49, left almost, well, within two months, we left for India on our real honeymoon. And I, had, I knew nothing of India. I had never been interested in India. And then suddenly here we were going, and he would not tell me anything about it, which I think was very wise, because then I had no preconceived notions when we arrived. We, are up, we live up in the hills, about 5,000 feet. It's, it's a little like Portland, because we have pine trees and all the same flowers and that sort of thing, and a beautiful climate. We do have these heavy monsoon rains, but not as much as Cherrapunji. And uh, we've had four children since we lived there. They're all now in the United States. <laughs> but we feel that this is a wonderful thing because we're having the best of both cultures, you might say. Now, this American connection was not new because I believe your mother was American. Yes, right. she came from the state of Idaho, Moscow, Idaho. And she was um, given a call. In 1904, she came across to India as a missionary on faith that God called her. But the man who was responsible for inviting her 
was a man, a colleague of my father's, who was in Calcutta at that time. And one of his colleagues came across to the um, United States and spoke at a meeting somewhere in the Northwest. And a uh, young lady, Nora Evelyn Nichols, responded and decided to go as a missionary to India. But before she did so, at the, on the evening when she went to the altar to dedicate her life to serve God, she was given the thought that uh, she should apologize to the man who had killed her father when she was about eight or ten years old. And she was gr uh, brought up on a farm in Idaho, and a neighbor had shot her father. Well, this, of course, rankled for many years. And on the evening when she heard this message and decided to go as missionary to India, this is what she had in her mind, that uh, she could not give a message of love to India without apologizing for the hatred that she had for the man who had uh, killed her father. So this was an influence in her life, and she was able to influence many, including my father, who went across and met her when she arrived in Calcutta, because she traveled with uh, a group of, a couple of missionaries who had also responded to the call of so he, this there was no of my question fathers. of them getting married then. Just no, 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 no. She went over as a faith missionary, and they worked for three years with various people, including my father. And um, 1907, they got married, and I'm one of the results of that marriage. <laughs> did, did you ever know her? Oh yes, we lived with them for the first four years. Two years, another. four years. So she must have helped so. you a bit to get into an Indian situation. Oh my, yes, yes. Although I moved into an American type of household, she did. She helped me a lot. She, of course, she knew the local language beautifully. And do and you speak Kasi? Somewhat. <laughs> yes, you speak very well, actually. <laughs> well, it's modest about it. No, but it's, it, I never studied it. I just learned it by being with people and listening. I think most of us have no idea that uh, there are large Christian parts of India. I mean, we think of India as a Hindu country, then some large Muslim groups, but mm. Christianity is quite strong in, in the northeast. Well, East. in the hill areas of northeast India, the churches are quite strong, and uh, in our state of Meghalaya, we have about uh, 45 to 48 percent are Christian. In Mizoram, there's about 95 percent, and so on. There are different areas of northeast India where the hill people have become a large number of them have become Christians. In the whole of Northeast India, which includes Assam, um, which is the biggest state, we have about a million Christians out of about 15 million population of the and total Now, you area. have a border with Bangladesh, and of course yes. they're Muslims. Was part of the problem of your cult the people in that area feel their culture was going to be swamped partly because it was a Muslim coming into Christian areas, or was that, it was not a religious thing? Well, it wasn't so much a religious mm. thing as uh, a population explosion that's going on all around Asia, and their area has more population per square mile than probably any any uh, part of Assam or any part of Northeast India. And many of the people of Bangladesh have come across, infiltrated into Assam, into Meghalaya, into other areas for economic reasons. Of course, during the partition trouble, between East Pakistan and West Pakistan, then a large number of refugees did come over. And that was just when our state was being created. And it was a great problem for us to take care of these refugees, uh, 750,000 of them uh, that poured into our state, not to speak of the huge millions that poured into West Bengal, Assam, and other places. But eventually they returned. Many of them, most of them returned when Bangladesh was created. But that infiltration still takes place. I think the fear of the infiltration is also very much a political fear because they are afraid of domination by increasing numbers of outsiders coming in and taking over politically. Do you find and that economic uh, problems too? Do you find that being a Christian is any way a handicap, or is it a help in relations with Indians in general who are not? No, it's not a handicap or a help. It's just uh, sometimes it's a, it's. A, some people are suspicious because they're not sure of what the Christian stands. But uh, there's nothing... There's nothing, nothing in the Constitution. India is uh, no, secular. No, India is a secular state. 
And Partially because of, of my father-in-law. Really? Yeah. He, he had a great part. He had to play. a part in the drafting of the. Yeah, he drafted the. Con yes. He helped to draft the constitution, and that was one of the interesting parts of the constitution which he had to battle to bring in this aspect that freedom of religion, practice, profession, propagation of your own religion should be totally free and not be controlled, not be a, a state which there would be a state religion. And this, I think, is a very, very good thing. Now, you didn't expect to go into politics, and not you didn't all. expect to be a politician's wife. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, how have you found that? Well, the first part of it was difficult. It, uh, because they were fighting for the Hill State, and it meant that they must, the men must be away, particularly in Delhi, for months and months at a time, it was a lonely thing. And one's bringing up small children, you want your husband to be there, and so on. But uh, after his visit to Panchgani in 68, there was a definite change, and well, now, I think that you brought up Panchgani. I don't think any of our listeners know what you mean by a visit to Panchgani. Well, this is a, a center for moral rearmament in western India, near Pune. Which and was, must be, what, a thousand, two, how many, how many miles is it from you? Two oh, my, at the other end of the country. It's about 1,500. 1,500 no, miles um, from... Yeah, about almost 2,000 miles from so where it's, we are. So it's a long trip. Uh, yes, it is bad. Yes, well, do tell us about that and, place uh, and what happened. It's a beautiful center, and it was being built and completed in 1968. And in 67, my husband met friends of moral rearmament in Delhi, and they had invited him to go for the opening of this center. So he took a choir, as he said. Because you and were very proud of your singing up there uh, in the North well, East. Well, yeah. many people in Northeast India yeah. sing. And we learn singing from, you know, when we are little fellows in church and Sunday school and school. And uh, everyone sings. Yes, I was very sorry yes. I didn't give you a bit of warning and a chance to practice. We could have heard a duet from you. Oh, well, I know your whole family sings. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I was um, interested when I heard friends who I met in Delhi at a dinner, Rajmohan Gandhi and other friends. That's who, the, the grandson of the Mahatma. Yeah, yes. grandson of, of Mahatma yes. Gandhi, grandson of Raja Gopalachari, the first Indian president of India. But he. I met for the first time with other friends, and he invited me to this opening of the Moral Riyaman Training Center, and he heard about our singing, I heard about the changes that had taken place in the world due to work of Moral Riyaman, reconciliation between France and Germany because of three or four people who had started taking steps. I was very interested. So when we went back, we organized a choir, and uh, Rajmohan came uh, to Shillong to encourage me to really pursue that. That's and the we capital went. of your state. Yes, that's the capital mm -hmm. of the state of Assam at that time. Now it's the capital of Meghalaya. And we went to Panchgani and found a marvelous uh, experience. I, for the first time, was made to understand that a political leader like myself did have a role to play in changing the world because I met uh, a man named Kim Beasley, a member of parliament from Australia. I met a member of parliament from, from Scotland, Patrick Woolwich Gordon. And these two men who had been fighting for moral standards, absolute moral standards in politics in Australia and in Scotland and in the United Kingdom made me very interested. I met people from the trade union movement. I met farmers. I met uh, Marxists I met who were previously Marxists, all kind of people I met. And for the first time in my life, I saw an answer to the problems that I had faced in, in my life, in the situation in the political world, in the industrial world, which I had been a part of, and uh, through changing persons, through individuals taking steps of change. And I was challenged. And I saw my role that, uh, well, here's something that I did not need to be a preacher like my father was. Well, he was a a preacher. God had called him to preach the gospel. He was actually a clergyman. He was yes. a clergyman. Mm -hmm. And he was also 